Okay, I'll make it nearly five past uh, two, so I think we'll, we'll make a start. Thank you everybody for, for joining us. Uh, my name's Matthew. I'm from Rugby Borough Council. I lead on communications and for some reason I find myself sat here um, leading this. Um, fortunately, you have some experts who are going to join us um, as well. So first off, can I just check, could, could somebody please tell me, can you see my, my screen um, that's sharing? Um, Yes, we can, Matthew, but can you Excuse clarify me. who's actually doing the recording, please? Yes, I can do that. Yep, I'll come on to that. Thank you. Thank Thanks you. for confirming that for me. Yeah, thank you. OK, so uh, there are lots of people with us. We had um, 60 sign up to join. I don't think we've quite got 60 on the call, but there's quite a lot of people to, to deal with in this way. So we're just going to ask if we can keep microphones and cameras off, please, um, unless we're speaking. Um, and then at, at various point we'll, we'll, we'll ask um, if there are any questions and there's a raise hand function that you can use just to raise that I and mean, we'll call on you to, to speak and you can you can switch your microphone and your camera on if you want to um, to put your question. Um, so as it's been raised um, already, um, just confirm we are recording the seminar. Um, so, you know, bear that in mind. Uh, we do intend to share the, uh, the, the recording afterwards um, so that we can open this up to a wider group of people who couldn't make it. Um, so you know, please bear that in mind. OK, I've, I've introduced my, myself. You'll hear a little bit later from Henry Biddington. Um, he deals with the commercial regulation team uh, of the council. We've got Paul Calver joining us, uh, Warwickshire Police. Uh, Ryan Baxter from Rugby First, and we've also got colleagues from uh, our licensing and economic development teams um, who will be able to answer questions if you have any later as well. Uh, so the, the agenda this afternoon, we've, we've, we've left some time, uh, you know, hopefully we won't have to use all of the time that we've, we've left, uh, but these are the, the topics we want to cover. We wanted to share with you some of the latest um, regional, sub-regional case data and information about how uh, how the government will decide which tier um, the rugby will be in going forward. I want to share with you some uh, possible dates around when that might happen and different scenarios so that you can be prepared. We'll talk then about the tier two restrictions, uh, what they are and, and how we, we will look to enforce them um, Paul will be able to give us some information around um, how Warwickshire Police intend to, to run their operation over the Christmas and New Year period. First, um, um, I'll tell you about the COVID advisors as well. And obviously, we want to be able to answer your questions too. So if, if this isn't what you joined for, you, you can leave now. Otherwise, um, we'll, we'll crack on. Uh, so that the, the question that we've all got, isn't it? So bear with me, I just let a few latecomers in. The question is, isn't it, which tier are we going to be in? Um, now, this is a decision that the government makes. It's not one that the council makes or any of the local authority or, or health partners make uh, within rugby. Warwickshire or even in the wider sub-region. This is a, a decision made by the Cabinet in, in London. Um, the, the five uh, sets of data that, that are looked at are those listed here. So there's the cases per 100,000 and those are the figures that we publish daily on our social media channels. Many of you would have seen those. Um, that's one factor. The, the others are the number of tests that are being carried out. Um, if, if there isn't much testing going on, then it, it, it might indicate that, um, that there's undetected cases. Um, the positivity rate, that's the proportion of how many tests that are taken uh, test positive, um, and anything either unduly low or unduly high is a cause for concern. There's the, the, the case rate in the over 65s, um, and that's because obviously they have a, a, a most vulnerabilities, most requirement for hospital care um, and a higher mortality 
capacity, right? And then there's the local healthcare capacity, which is obviously how many beds are available in, uh, oh, welcome, and how many beds are available in the local hospitals. So we're able to, to give you some of that information now so that we can see where we might be. Uh, okay. Um, Graphics here are perhaps not the easiest to share in this form, but this is the actual graphic produced by Public Health England uh, that, that is, is used um, to consider some of the, you know, the tiering uh, arrangements. So I want to be helpful to share it directly with you regardless. So up, up here we've got uh, case rates, and this, is, this shows the entire West Midlands region, and we've got uh, Coventry, Warwickshire, Solihull, and this area here. Uh, big amber area there is Stratford, and, and this is us here in Rugby. Um, but as it indicates here is that within that Coventry, Warwickshire, Solihull area, um, we have a, 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 a moderate case case number across uh, most of those, those um, that central area, but none even in Bedworth um, is in that top in that top area. So looking at just the the, the, uh, the case rates, we we can see that actually at the moment as a as a whole, we're possibly not there yet. But what uh, this graphic shows us is the rate of change. So it's all moving in the right direction. And up in North Warwickshire here, it's it's dropping faster than, than anywhere else. Um, so um, you, you could look at this, this area and say that actually um, this amber area kind of aligns with, with um, a, a a tier one um, and this red area here kind of aligns with a tier two and this top area here kind of aligns with a tier three. Now for many reasons this isn't a hard and fast, it's not, that's not the judgment that will be made but it's part of a consideration that will be made. We've got here the positivity rate um, around the proportion of tests that, that come back positive so out of 100 tests between four and seven and a half um, come back as positive. There's nothing really to be concerned of in the in our area here and in terms of a number of tests being carried out there are not large areas or communities that are not being tested so um, there's nothing too much to worry about there. Um, how the exceedance um, is all green so we don't need to worry about that one. Um, Desperately trying to move the slide on to show you what comes next. Um, and I don't know what you can now see, but I've lost that screen altogether. It's gone back to which tier, Matthew? Yeah, thank you. OK, lab confirmed COVID cases. Is that what you can see? Yes. Yes. Thank yeah. you. So this is data as of this morning. Um, so what we're looking for really is, um, is everywhere under 150? And the answer is not quite yet. Um, I need to bed with is 182 and a half. Now I should, should point out that the, uh, the data that will be used will be the data that, that is available next, next Wednesday on the 16th. Um, but that data will relate to tests that are being taken today and tomorrow. Um, so, you know, there's no opportunity for us to change what what happens, um, but there's another week's worth of data to come through. Um, I'm not sure if I've explained that particularly well, but the, 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 the point is that um, uh, we've lost the opportunity now to influence which way this goes because the, the, the the latest data available will be today's data and that will be available about this uh, Wednesday next week. So, um, here's the final indicator that, that we'll be looking at, which is the over 60s case data. Um, there's a bit of a time lag on, on how this data is reported, but I just wanted to show it you just so you could see, you know, so you've got the same data that we have really. Um, we, we've got this chart at the top here. This is since the stomach through to today, right, right hand end, and underneath we've got um, sort of beginning of November through to um, through to a, a week or so ago. Uh, here, the right hand end. 
Um, uh, from bottom to top on, on both charts, we've got the age range from uh, noughts to nines all the way up to a 90 plus here. And what we're looking for here um, is where, where are the darker colours? So you can see around about uh, the, the 10th of November, we had more cases that aligns with the big peak. Um, and that was in the 20 to 30 age group and the 50 to 60 age group and so on and so forth. What we're looking here is how, how much colour is there from this point up? And at this point, we can probably say there are too many cases uh, in the over 60s um, at this point, but the trend is down. Um, uh, and, and that's the important thing to note. So that's the data that will be looked at, and that's the latest we've got that will be updated, and I will have a, an updated uh, view on that. But we want to make it clear that you know the trend in all of these is the right direction. We're not there yet, so we're not sure whether or not there, there's reasonable cause to expect a change um, next week. But these are the dates um, that, that we're looking at. Um, now, one thing we found through this is that things change quickly. So although this is what we think as of today, um, of course, it might change before then. But at the moment, we're expecting that the cabinet will meet uh, on the 16th and they'll make their decision uh, based on the, the data that we've, we've shared um, then. They'll announce it on the 17th and they're expected to come into effect then on the 19th. Now, um, we've had different dates being put around, um, but I, like I say, this is our best um, information at the moment. This is what we're expecting. Now, um, we have been told that these tiers will be reviewed every two weeks. So that would mean that after the 16th, the next review date will be on the 30th. And the same pattern would, su would suggest the announcement on the 31st and to come into effect from the 2nd. Of course, they may decide that over the new year period, it's not a sensible time to do that. But th this is the information we have at the moment. And I think it's, you know, the more you have, the more, the, the better prepared you can be. So, uh, can we expect to go to review uh, tier two of the review date on the 16th? Uh, well, the answer is we don't know. Um, I hope you can understand from the data shared why we don't know at this point um, and, can, and can see um, that there isn't clarity on that yet. Um, but equally, we think it would be sensible for you to have plans in place should you wish to open, should that announcement be made. So at this point, um, I'll see if I can work out how to stop sharing my screen um, and then we'll move on to um, to Henry. Uh, whilst I do that, um, anyone has any questions on that and wants to use the raise hand? OK, um, yep, Sarah Simpson. Uh, you're, you're currently muted. Yeah, you know the government figures, the figures that the government look at? Yeah. Do they, do they look at them up to and including next Wednesday, or are they likely to be looking at... Is it today's figures? Or do so, they yeah, carry on? Yeah, this is the bit I wasn't very clear on, isn't it? So they will look at the figures as they are um, on the date that they look at them, on the 16th. Um, the point I was trying to get across is that that data is data that is, um, that, that will be based on tests and that are taking place at the moment. But they'll look at the data as it is next Wednesday is it the 16th? So there's so there's opportunity then for whatever they can do in Nuneaton to either get find out where the why their numbers are so high. There's still time for those numbers to come down then. So the numbers are currently coming down. Um, I, I don't think there is time to actually influence what uh, make any more interventions to to change what is going to happen because these the people whose test results will be reported this time next week 
will already be infected and be having their tests. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Thank you for that. Give me an opportunity to explain what I meant properly. Thank you. Uh, Henry. Thank you, Matthew. Um, good afternoon, everyone. Um, welcome to this seminar. Thank you, everybody. My name is Henry Biddington. I'm Principal Environmental Health Officer for our commercial regulation team at Rugby Borough Council. Um, I, yeah, just big thank you, really, for everybody for joining us on this seminar. Um, it just goes to show uh, you know, how conscious all of our, our businesses are that you will want to attend and you will want to hear um, our advice. Um, and I would also like to say a big thank you to all of our businesses who have um, endured or, or, or dealt with the fact that we are in tier tier three. And I think Matthew, some, of, some of the data that Matthew shares really demonstrates sort of what some of those decisions, why that, that happened. Um, and it, you know, and it has it demonstrating that the, the figures are coming down. Um, so we appreciate all of the efforts that's been put in by our local businesses um, to to follow the rules uh, and to 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 remain vigilant and, and do everything that you can. So that's that's my first first thing is to say thank you. Obviously, we are still in tier three, uh, which has a massive uh, effect on hospitality in that you can't have the customers uh, sitting and eating within the premises. Um, and that may continue. So, but what we want to do is to prepare businesses as best we can, or you to be prepared as best you can. If we do move into tier tier two, um, as Matthew said, that could be quite a, a rapid change. Um, so, just a quick outline, really, on on what the tier two uh, regulations would, would require hospitality and, and businesses to be doing. Um, so, you may be well, well aware of this. You're probably all read up on, on what can can and can't be done. Uh, essentially. The hospitality uh, bars, uh, sorry, restaurants, etc., and pubs can open, um, and cafes. We would need to, uh, if you're serving food, uh, alcohol, sorry, you need to, to continue. Um, sorry, you need to start to serve it with a substantial meal. The table service um, will continue as it was previously to to the lockdown. Uh, there'll be no mixing of households within within the the, the restaurant or or pub setting. Uh, so it will be household groups only. Um, you'll need to complete continue doing your test and trace as you were before. Um, and the, the, the premises will need to be vacated by 11 o'clock and stop serving uh, alcohol at 10 o'clock. Um, so they're, they're the sort of like basics, basic rules. I'm sure you've all been sort of made aware of those. Uh, just a couple of things to pick up on. I know there's been lots of talk about substantial meals and, and some of you may have some further questions about that. Um, so actually what the regulations is, is a substantial meal or meal must be served uh, a main midday meal a main evening meal or a breakfast but it's basically it says in the regulations a main meal so we'd expect you to be looking at, at what your menu is and serving main main course food off your menu as, as, as that as a, that substantial meal um, implies uh, the other thing to consider is you know is, is you have to sort of be reasonable about how many then drinks or, or alcohol that you may want to serve with those substantial meals. So if somebody's finishing off a bottle of wine they bought with a meal, that's fair enough, but we wouldn't be expecting you to be then serving a further six, seven, eight pints uh, for people just to to get on a session, etc. cetera. Um, so th that's really, we're asking businesses to be reasonable, to think about how you're doing it, um, to be prepared for that. Um, the other thing, I would say, as, as Matthew sort of said, how are we going to enforce the regulations? It's, it's not a word we we use, first of all, um, when, when we're dealing with these um, regulations. What we want to do is we want to advise, we want to educate, we want to help businesses so they can comply with the regulations. Our last, our last thing we want to be doing is taking enforcement actually against all of our businesses, any of our businesses. Uh, we know how hard the businesses, particularly in the hospitality sector, worked to get your sales when you reopened in July and I did a lot of visits and I did a lot of talking with local businesses and 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 I know that how hard you worked and how well you did um, so we're not about the enforcement is it's not the, the our main our main way of, 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 of helping people to con, um, to comply with regulations it is all about trying to get everybody to comply in a reasonable way educate if you've got any questions about anything you can come to us we'll help you We'll give you as much guidance as we possibly can. Um, you know, obviously, if if you completely flout the regulations and you don't listen to advice, then yes, then we do have enforcement powers and we can take 
action, um, you know, to, to, to stop you from trading um, or improvement notices, etc. But that's that is the last resort. We'd much rather, you know, talk to you in the forums like this. You know, you're all obviously keen to to hear what advice we've got for you, um, and keep that relationship going between us as a as a regulator and and the, and the businesses, um, so we can all open safely, uh, but at least get get open. Okay. Um, so I think that's it from me regarding the tier two regulations. I'm sure you'll probably have some further questions for me, but uh, I don't have anything ad additional to add, but I'll, I'm obviously happy to answer any questions. And let's so we do questions at the end, Matthew, and take it over to Paul. Yeah, OK. So I think we'll hold the questions until the end. Uh, and but Paul, do you want to just come in on the uh, the policing side of things? Well, he's trying to get unmuted. This always happens at the most inconvenient moments. Nope, not working. OK. <laughs> Is Matthew able to unmute Paul? I can't, I'm afraid. I just just had a look. I, I can't do that. Um, Paul, do you want to try leaving and rejoining? And uh, we'll we'll get um, uh, Ryan's input uh, whilst we wait for you. Thank you. Um, so Ryan, rugby first. Is, is there anything you wanted to to add about how you expect to be operating over the Christmas and New Year period or, or any support for businesses? Hi, oh, yes. Um, so obviously we're still going to be um, around as we always are um, 364 days in a year. Um, if any of the town centre businesses need any help in reopening, uh, including any COVID measures um, in terms of social distancing, again, we can help with like, floor stickers, uh, hand sanitizer, um, and then if any advice that is needed for, um, for the town centre businesses, then if just contact me. Um, or just give the office a call, or speak to one of the rangers, we can get that sorted. Obviously, we work very closely with the council, so if there's a question that I can't answer for you, or you know, anybody else in the office can't answer, um, then we can get the answer for you from um, from the council. Uh, I can see that Paul's rejoined, um, so I'll, I'll let Paul uh, go now. Uh, Henry, OK? Can you hear me now? Brilliant, thank you, Paul. Brilliant, okay. Sorry about that, some reason I couldn't unmute yet. Yeah. Paul Calver, Sergeant in Warwickshire Police, um, and the lead for licence in Warwickshire Police, but I'm also working within our COVID cell for our COVID response, uh, and I've been doing so since March uh, this year. Uh, a couple of things, really, from myself, from a police perspective. Um, obviously, I know Matthew wanted to speak, me to speak about policing at Christmas. Um, our response, our policing at Christmas will be similar to most years. But obviously that will also be determined by what tier we're in during the Christmas period and what happens on the 16th. So we are set up ready for a Christmas um, as we would any other year with our numbers in place, uh, with our staffing, our visibility around the town centres and the nighttime economy. But again, those hours are flexible and variable at this moment in time, depending on, like I said, on what tier we're in, uh, on what, how hospitality will be open. So that's, that's the first thing I wanted to mention. Uh, a couple of other things really I just wanted to quickly mention. Um, obviously everybody's seen these items in the press about London and things like that that's happened over the weekend and obviously they're in tier two. Uh, I have spoken to colleagues of mine in the Met to establish you know, what was happening in hospitality and things like that. And the biggest issue that came across um, that caused the, the most problems within London was actually households mixing. So rather than staying in their, their household bubbles whilst going into hospitality, everybody was mixing. Um, and hence now the, the, the virus levels in London are starting to rise, uh, as it was announced last night. Um, but the, one, that's one of the biggest issues they've come across since being in tier two. So that's a really important point that obviously during, like Henry said, whilst in tier two, 
it's still the family bubbles um, only. Uh, there's no groups of six from six different households or things like that. So um, just need to bear that in mind. The other thing I wanted to mention as well with regard to Christmas, obviously we've got the Christmas window, the 23rd to the 27th of December. Just need to stress that only applies to household mixing within household mixing. Um, so in private dwellings and things like that with regard to the three family bubbles. It does not apply to hospitality. So whatever tier we are in come the 16th, it is the same rules and regulations in the hospitality industry during the, the Christmas period of the 23rd to the 27th. So that mixing of three families does not is not allowed uh, within that setting. Um, the, the only other point really that I wanted to make um, was the fact that obviously there are different rules and regulations in tiers between tier one, two and three. And we have seen issues since the tier system came in prior to lockdown with people from other tiers taking advantage of areas that are in lower tiers, uh, especially in the hospitality industry where people from a higher tier would try and come to a lower tier to be able to mix and congregate. Obviously, the rules state that the tier that the hospitality is in is the tier that they have to apply, but also anybody that comes from a higher tier has to abide by the rules of whatever tier they're in. So obviously tier between tier two and three, that really doesn't have much effect on gatherings and things like that. But if we did, or when we do drop down to tier one, um, and other areas outside us are in a higher tier, that just has to be bear in mind. And the final thing I'd like to point across really is just to reiterate what Henry said. We're not here to try and issue fixed penalties, uh, enforce, et cetera, et cetera. We're here to try and work with everybody. All the webinars I've done over the, the last months between hospitality, retail and all the other areas, it's all about helping people. We know how people have struggled within the hospitality industry and the retail industry, and we want to help you. We all want to thrive in nighttime economy back that's safe, but we are here to help. So please, if you're unsure about anything or if you're not sure whether you can do what you want to do, then please speak to people like Henry. And I know Zulfi's on the line as well from the licensing. Please speak to your local authority before you go ahead and thinking it's OK when you're not sure, because we don't want to be sending police officers or regulatory services there. We'd rather help you out beforehand to make sure what you're doing is right and within the guidelines. Uh, so that's that's all from myself, really. And just you know, I'll take questions later. Thank you, Paul. Um, sorry, I had to, to uh, step away a little earlier just to, to shut my dog up. So uh, I'm sorry about that. Um, so Ryan, I don't know if you got to finish what you wanted to say, or if there's anything you wanted to um, to, to add before we move on. Yeah, just a couple more things, please, uh, Matthew. Um, so obviously the rangers um, for the daytime economy are going to be out and about again. Um, again, helping the businesses in whichever way they can. Um, as you know from last time, they are going to be working alongside the Rumborough Council um, enforcement wardens, so the uh, community safety wardens, uh, offering advice um, to um, anybody who needs any help with COVID marshalling. Um, and just another thing, obviously for the nighttime economy, if you do have any issues um, with people inside of your premises uh, that are causing you issues or not adhering to um, the restrictions or any problems, obviously our control room is manned 24 hours a day. Uh, so for those of you within the town centre, um, if you have a retail radio, a shop net radio, pub net, contact us via that and we'll get somebody there straight away. Um, if you don't have a radio, give us a call. Um, we've got a direct link to the police, so we get a faster, quicker response time to the police control room. Um, so they can obviously escalate things however they need to. So worst case scenario, if you need to, then, you know, they'll send the police unit out know, if there is one available. Um, but again, that's um, worst case scenario. So, but, um, but yeah, but like I said, we work very closely with the council and the police. So uh, yeah, feel free to come and ask us uh, for any advice, same as the local authority, please. Thank you, Ryan. Um, let's go back to Henry um, for just information about the community wardens and the COVID advisors. Um, so obviously the wardens cover 
a wider area than simply the town centre. They cover the, the whole borough, but the, the advisors as well are operating in the town. Henry, anything to, to fill us in there? And then we'll, we'll move to uh, to wider questions from people. Oh, that's fine. Thank you, Matthew. Uh, yeah, I think it's just um, for those who are in the town centre, when we when we, when we had the, uh, the operation, uh, the legislation change came in and we had the 10 o'clock curfew, um, we we had our wardens at, out and about um, in the town centre offering advice, what we call COVID advisors, um, helping people, directing people to taxi ranks and, and helping people to, to socially distance and keeping an eye on, on the premises just to make sure everybody's um, customers are aware of what they should be doing, uh, and businesses are aware of what they should be doing. So that's something that will come in again um, within the town centre. That's where we have most of the issues um, so once the nighttime economy does reopen and if we, we're back to, to tier two, that that uh, that will start up again. And obviously the community wardens are, are, are do cover the whole of, of rugby. Um, so if there are particular issues in particular areas that we need to look at, we can also offer those services. And we do have some access to some other uh, COVID advisors if we do have specific issues that we want looking at. They are there to advise, not to enforce. Um, they're there to, to, to assist. Um, more than heavy handed enforcement. OK, thank you very much for that. Um, so let's just open it up now and for questions. I can see a hand raised already. Darren, I'll come to you in just a second. Um, so we've got uh, Henry, Paul and Ryan, um, who you've already heard from. We've also got um, representatives from the Borough Council licensing and uh, economic development teams. And I believe we may also have participants from Warwickshire County Council online as well. And if, if they are and can help, I'll invite them to contribute to any answers as well. So at this point then, if you, if you have any questions um, or, on anything that we've, we've discussed so far or any related item, then, then please raise your hand. And in the meantime, we'll go to, to Darren. Hey guys, um, just a quick question regarding the wardens. Um, a lot of the forum so far has been about sort of rugby city centre as a main. What about sort of like the little villages? Obviously, I'm in Wollstone. There's a lot of little villages that are obviously rugby as a borough, which we don't get a lot of support in terms of the wardens policing, which we could do with a little bit more help. As, as certainly in Wollstone as, as a village, we have two pubs here and we have a huge population. It's very, very hard. It would just be idea, you know, some support would be good. We seem to sort of be forgotten about a little bit. Hi, Darren. Yeah, um, to be, the wardens do cover the whole of rugby, to be fair. Uh, they've got a lot on. I appreciate that we have concentrated a little bit on the town centre. Um, that's where we had the majority of the issues initially. Um, but uh, yeah, I mean, if you're having specific issues in Bolston, we can obviously offer that support. Uh, please contact me. And we, it's, if there's any specific issues regarding Bolston, yes, we will help. The wardens do go out to specific problems um, in relation to, to complaints, etc. Um, or, or, or so do our, our officers. So, yeah, if, if there's anything specific regarding some of the villages or, or, or outer lying areas, then quite happy to, to engage with you on those. Just from, sorry, just from a policing perspective as well, just to follow that up, Darren, uh, from a policing perspective, obviously, our numbers uh, are obviously not fight night. Um, you know, we have limited numbers around the county uh, and it's very much intelligence led. So it will be about where the crime, where the incidents take place, where our, our main visibility will be. But if there is specific intelligence or specific concerns or problems uh, within your area, then please, if you, if you go on to the um, Warwickshire Police website uh, and look for the locator, find my team, there will be contact details for your local SNT where you can raise those concerns about Wollstone with them and have that conversation to see whether there's something specific we need to do for that area or any other area of rugby. So it's not just about the town centres as such, but it needs that conversation maybe. If there's things that the local teams aren't aware about um, that they may need to be aware of. So please feel free to have a look at the website uh, and contact your local safe and neighbourhood team to discuss any issues or concerns you've got now or in the future over Christmas for that area. Thank you. Thank you, Paul. Henry, did you want to come back on that? Um, no? no, sorry, that hand oh, went up accidentally. OK, fine. So if there's anything I'd, I'd add to that response, um, Darren, really, is, I, I suppose if there's a, a particular day of a week or, or time, you know, if it's um, 
if it's last orders or, or, or whatever, where the problems particularly happen, then it'll be useful to let people know because al although it's probably unlikely we're going to be able to send people out on the off chance, if, if we know that actually a problem is more likely to be occurring at a particular date or time, then it is easier to, to arrange that. So, you know, do let us know if that's the case. OK, thank you for that. Um, let's move to, I think it was uh, Matt Corrie who was, was next with a hand raised. Hi, um, ringing, calling from Rugby Golf Club. Can you hear me? Hi, Matt. Yes, we can hear you. Yeah. Yeah. Well, um, so obviously at the golf club, um, they're playing golf now. It's all socially distanced, etc. Um, um, but the clubhouse is shut, apart from the toilet. Um, so with my my question there from is with the mixing the households, um, is that the same outside as inside? Um, so if people want to sit outside, are they able to? Because I know in some cases people were able to sit. Uh, out, outside in mixed groups, is that not going to be allowed um, under tier two? I think yes, you can sit outside in tier two in a household of six. Um, but again, if you're selling alcohol or things like that, it would need to be. I think Paul's going to just check, triple check the regs for me. <laughs> um, but I think the uh, the I think if, again, if it, if the people are sitting outside um, and drinking alcohol, obviously they need to be served a meal to do so um so it would be um, for, for the most part there's obviously a few people who are family who play uh, yeah. but for the most part um you know if people went out in a four ball that would be yeah. four separate households so, yeah, so would they be able to sit outside at all or would that still not count outside as well well currently they can't because we're in tier three but yes right. outside in, if you're in tier two my understanding is that yes you can have out uh, up to six a group of six so it goes back to rule of six outside yeah but not inside. Not inside, no. And then with the inside, if um, obviously if you can only have, say, uh, like for example, three guys come in at the same time, but they're all a different household, um, uh, would they be able to sit at the same table if there's a certain distance? No. So even if we had like a huge table and they're opposite each other, that would not count. It would have to be just one household per table. Yes. Right. Okay. Real. Yeah. We we don't set the rules, but we we try and interpret them for you. Yeah. 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 Does that address the question, Matt, or is there, is there anything, yeah, anything else? Yeah. Thank you for that. that that's useful. Um, so next it was Ollie, please. Hi there, it's Scott Wyman. Actually, it's not um, Ollie. I've nicked my son's account. Can you hear me? Hi, Scott. Yeah. Thank you. Sorry, yeah, um, not brilliant technology. Um, I just wanted to check your dates, Matthew, you mentioned earlier, the 16th, 17th and 19th. Do you know that they're, they're kind of set in stone or are those dates that um, you're predicting that we might be open the 19th? I'm just trying to predict ordering patterns and, and the like. But they are our current best guess based on the information that we have. There's, there's certainly not a prediction about what right, we've been okay. led to believe um, Will, will be the pattern uh, and the dates. Um, so these these were dates that were shared by the Prime Minister in a letter to his MPs. Um, that doesn't mean that they won't change, but you know they're the best dates we have. Yeah, okay. I've seen I've seen what they'd released. I just didn't know if you knew more. Thanks. Okay. I think sorry, Matthew. I think just from our perspective, sort of living through this pandemic and the regulations as they've come and gone over the last eight months. Um, things just may change they may be the dates but you know it's just a case of keeping your eye on watching the news watching the media keep subscribing to local um to national sort of subscriptions around licensing and things like that to keeping abreast of things i mean an example would be that when we came into the tier system recently out of lockdown that's the date that it was supposed to happen actually changed by 24 hours yeah you know, <laughs> so you know it, it it's it's a very fluid sort of system that we're under uh, and we are in the same position as you because we can only predict these are the dates but obviously until it's actually announced officially nobody can actually say for, with you know with 100 percent certainty okay yeah thanks for that yeah for just further to that sorry uh, I, I just yeah just i think it, there is just to be a an, 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 a caution really i think i know it's very difficult for businesses because you need to get your orders in and get your 
everything prepared to reopen to, to, for when you do reopen. So I would really just wait until that announcement's made if you, if you possibly can, because we don't know which way that that announcement's going to go. So I'd, I'd hate for a business to to order in a load of food and alcohol or, or whatever to, to then be told we're actually going to stay in tier three. So it's just yeah, just to be really cautious. And I know that's difficult, particularly in the hospitality trade. But yeah, I wouldn't, yeah. wouldn't want you to lose out on any more than you already have. OK, yeah, thank you. Cheers. Thank you for that, Scott. I think um, I think uh, we know what's on your Christmas list. You need your, your own kit, don't you? Um, next up was uh, Councillor Lawrence. Okay. Right. Thank you for that. Yes, two questions. Um, if you're in the town centre, lovely. Um, obviously, Rugby First can provide you with stickers and that. But what about pubs and clubs that are not in the town centre? What sort of posters and help have you got for those? That's the first question. And secondly, there's been a lot in the press this week about if you're a live music event and you have got a stage and you've got live music, then you can serve alcohol and you do not need to serve a meal. So can we have some clarification on that, please? Okay, I'll tell you, shall I uh, bring the first? I don't know whether it's Henry yeah. Zulfi or Matthew on that. Matthew, do you want to uh, if if I deal with the first one, then, not, then you can look up the answer to the second one while I do it. I've already, I've already left the answer. Up, so oh, we fine. Have... Okay. <laughs> <laughs> so... Um, we can provide resources for uh, for pubs and clubs and, and, and whatever to print and use themselves. Um, we can't provide any pre-printed, but we can. What we can do is we can put together some resources and put them on our website. And what we'll do is we'll um, email the participants on on this call, so if if they want to use those, they can download those and and, and use those. Um, so, Henry, you you already knew the answer anyway, but uh, for the second part. Yeah, there we go. So, yes, that has been um, some things in the press this week about um, being turning pubs and etc. into what they classify as a menu. So the, the regulations are quite specific about that. Um, so, yes, uh, you don't have to provide a meal where the, the music is provided to a cinema, theatre, concert hall or sports ground. Um, so I think that's that's the answer. I don't think any of our public houses are classed as cinemas, theatres, concert halls or sports grounds. And I think we'd look at the planning, what their planning classes are. Um, and we had this previously um, with regards to this, with regards to the curfew time, in, not within rugby, but uh, a premises was trying to call themselves a concert hall um, so they could get uh, past the 10 o'clock curfew time. Um, so there, there is an exemption for the table meal, but it does only apply to specific premises and it doesn't apply to pubs and clubs. Right. Could you then please check the Morton Club and Institute, which has a concert hall with a stage and integral bar and check whether that qualifies because it is actually designated as a concert hall. OK, oh, well, we can have a look into that for you. Okay. Thank you. Can I just come in on that point as well, Henry? Just. Uh, from my contact with obviously London, one of the biggest challenges they've had in London is what you've just raised, premises that are trying to say they are um, concert halls, theatres, et cetera, that are pubs. Uh, and I know that the Met have been looking at enforcement um, on some of those venues because it has caused major problems. Um, like Sir Henry said, we've only had one venue in Warwickshire that's tried to suggest this um, since sort of the, the, the regulations came in, but obviously it's something that we all will look at quite rigorously um, if people are taking advantage of the situation uh, and because it's only unfair on the venues that are towing the line and um, you know, operating under the regulations. So we have to have a level playing field for everybody. OK, thank you for that. Can I just, you, sorry, can just, Henry, can I just add, on. add on to that? Sorry, so obviously that is only in tier two as well. Um, so currently tier three even if you've got concert halls and cinemas aren't open anyway so that, that will only be when we move to tier two yes thank you for that clarification okay there are, there are no more hands raised at the moment so there's a kind of a final call oh yep we, we have one um okay so sarah simpson please yeah hi thank you um if we do get down to tier two 
Um, I know at the moment gyms are open, whether they're tier one, two or three. Um, I manage the Rugby Thornfield Indoor Bowls Club. At tier two, are we able to open? Okay, it's good for you, Henry. <laughs> Thank you. So indoor sports will only be able to take place. So you can't have indoor sports between interactions of people from different households. So technically, unless they can play bowls within their own households, then the answer would be no. Um, so going to the gym, we can go to the gym with 50 people, not in our household. That's the, yeah, that's the way the regulations yeah. are, yeah. Right. It, it have we what, what support then are we got because i mean our we have 1600 square meters and all we're wanting to put is 48 people social distancing at two meters to play bowls so you're saying that can't happen but we can have 100 people at the leisure center across the road all from different households under the regulations that that would appear so if you want to contact me directly and we can discuss yep. whether there's an exemption or whether we can look at that and we can have a look or at where the regulations we go to how to kind of get them regulations change maybe because to me with yeah with, with regards to that we can't change the regulations but possibly you can speak to your mp but we do sit on a, a regulatory group um, we do look at the regulations and if you come to me with what you're proposing and we can look at whether there's um an exemption or whether that's something that can be done and if not okay. obviously how you can then go to i'm quite happy for you to i'll, I'll leave my contact details in the uh, the, the chat um and yep. you can email me directly with what you're proposing etc and we'll, okay. we'll look at it from there I, I, don't, I don't think i can discuss it any further on this, this sort no, of thing. no that's fine no that's wonderful um that, if, if we do have to stay closed i have asked this question a few times on the social media sites and also emailed the council twice but not had an answer the grant that we get for every 28 days we're closed do we have to apply for every 28 days or is it automatically given to us every every 28 days we've applied for the first one but do we keep having to apply every 28 days whilst we're closed? So uh, this is what I, we have seen your question, Sarah, and we were waiting for an answer So back on this, because what we'd like to do here is to be able to do it automatically. Um, but I don't want to promise that until I have an answer that that is the case. Yeah, um, no, it's fine if we did have to apply. It's just so that we yeah. knew that everyone, obviously having zero income. Oh, absolutely. If we, we know we have to apply each 28 days we can be on it on the 29th day go right come on yes. let's get the application form in so yeah it's just just knowing really completely understand i just don't want to give you information but, but no that's right. fine I, I, yeah. we'll certainly um look when i have an answer I'll, I'll, I'll reply to your your question on our facebook page um, wonderful thank you. thank you thank you for that sarah um shirley Mute. There we go. Hi there. Um, I have two questions. Um, the first one is um, if we're allowed to reopen on the second, a business meeting, how is that um, classed um, with regard to a household? Because I've been told by a customer that they're allowed to do it in tier two places to have a business meeting in a restaurant. That's my first question. And my second question is last time, whilst we made it very clear that it was one household on, only on occasions you knew people were lying how um much proof should, should we be asking for proof should we be actually policing this i mean we make it obvious you put it on the bookings you tell people but if people choose to lie to you how do we stand then do you want me to answer the, the answer the household one first henry and i'll let you answer the other part to it yeah, with regard, we've had this conversation before on previous webinars that I've done about it and uh, this. I accept, we accept, it is really difficult. Um, I'm not going to try and make it any easier than it sounds. It is really difficult to establish whether the household, household bubbles, etc, etc. Believe me, when we say when we get called to people's houses all the time from people reporting, people breaching regulations indoors, we find it just as hard to actually prove whether someone's in a family bubble or whether it's a different family bubble because there's no register as you know so it's really difficult so i'm not going to say it's easy whatsoever all we ask is you try your best if it's obvious then obviously you know it's then we would be asking those people to 
leave if necessary, if they won't abide by the rules. We do not expect you to put yourself in a position of danger and get into a situation where it's going to get volatile or things like that. Your venues have got door supervisors, that's what they're for to deal with. If you haven't got door supervisors and get into that situation, then you have to call the police. You know, we're, I'm not going to sort of say we're not there to help because we are there to help. Uh, we just ask venues to try and do it as best they can. Demonstrate that you try to do it as your best you can. And that's all we can ask. It's not a simple task whatsoever to try and establish whether they're in one household or not. Sometimes it's really obvious. Sometimes it's not. It's not easy. And you have every sympathy with it from us with regard to that, because we find it just as challenging in private dwelling. So I'm sorry, it's not, it's not a straight answer, I'm afraid. But. We're not expected to ask for physical proof because that is too just too difficult. OK, thank no. you. No. I think just to follow on to that, I'm absolutely right. You know, I think if you can demonstrate that you've asked the question, you know, we, and you, they, you, they've told you what they've yeah. told you, that they yeah. are in a household bubble, yeah. you know. Yeah. People, unfortunately, will, will lie and do, do what they want to, to try and bend the rules. And and yeah, that, that, as, as Paul says, if you're finding that you're having issues with those people, then then, you know, take your normal steps, I suppose. Um, in relation to the business meeting one, we've had this come up as well. And I think there's a few premises in London which are taking advantage of this. Um, so um, <clears throat> Yeah. There is an exemption for business meetings, um, but it is they have, it has to be reasonable that that meeting has to take place and it has to have a certain amount of business. So having a flip chart at the front of a, a restaurant and saying it's a business meeting probably isn't a reasonable thing to be doing. Um, so there does need to be a, a reason for the business meeting and a, a restaurant probably isn't the most appropriate place to be doing that. So I think we can look at that a little bit more detail. Um, because I think we need to probably just check through the exemptions a little bit more. So I'm not going to give you a further answer off the top of my head, but I'm, again, I've put my contact details in the, the address um, and we can come back on, on, on that one if you if you want us to. OK, thank you. I would like you to. Yes, please. OK. Thank you. Thank you for that, Shirley. I'll just make a, a note of, of that to contact you about that. Um, in the meantime, the next question was from Ish, please. Uh, you're not muted, but I can't hear you, Ish. Oh, I think Ish is gone. Let's move on to uh, to Matt again. Hi, um, just a quick one. Uh, it was just a question of fines. Uh, obviously, I'm not planning on uh, breaking any, but in uh, the last lockdown, it was sometimes easier when people were trying to order a drink like uh, after 10 o'clock when you're trying to get them out the door by 10. It was easier to tell them, well, if we give you a drink, it's going to cost you at least 20 grand because we're going to have to cover that by the fine. Um, so just as like an example of what any fines are, so people are aware of, um, of what it's going to cost the business or them. Uh, do you want me to answer that, Henry? Um, it, it's first of all, I just want to put it put it on record the fact that fines wise from the police, they are very low in numbers when it comes to businesses. Uh, most businesses are compliant. So if you look for you say for rugby, for example, in, in um, November, it was only one fine issued to a business for the whole of November compared to 200 odd fines across the county for different things. So they put that into perspective. Secondly, fines wise, it, it all depends on the level of the breach of the regulation to what the fine would be. So, for example, the, the you gave there about serving after hours, um, after the 10 o'clock, then you'd be looking at probably a thousand pounds fixed penalty, which doubles on each offence up to 10,000 pounds. OK, so, you know, first offence, a thousand, two thousand, four thousand, eight thousand, then ten thousand is the last one. If there is a gathering of 30 or more, involved in that sort of breach then you'd be looking at ten thousand pound fine for anybody that's organizing that gathering or helping that organization of the gathering so that doesn't just mean one person that could be three or four people have ten thousand pound fines each um, obviously the 200 pound fines is for people that breach gathering rules and things like that which again double up to i think three thousand two hundred pounds um, so they are varying levels for varying things but i just need to stress that as police and the regulatory authorities, we follow what we call the 4E approach, 
which is about engaging, explaining and educating people and businesses about what the regulations are <clears throat> and what the rules are. The fourth E is enforcement, and that is the very last one we do. Um, yeah. So you know, yeah. just, I just need to reiterate that bit as well. So <clears throat> it's quite clear that we do try and engage and educate people exactly the same as what the, the council and the county do as well. But the level of fines, you know, do vary on the offence. Yeah. OK, now it was obviously not planning on doing anything like that. It was just uh, sometimes it's a good way to shut people up when they start arguing against us. No, that's fine. And obviously the fine would be levelled at the business or the person that was in charge of the business at the time. So, yeah, you're quite right. Um, it could be costly. Yeah. Thanks for that. Henry, is there anything you wanted to, to add to that? Um, no, I don't think so. Again, it would be, you know, it, it's not to, it's not our, 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 our go to straight to enforcement, but obviously we did identify breaches then then fixed penalty notices are one of our enforcement tools. Uh, and as Paul set out, the, the level of fines is the same for us as it is for, for uh, the police. OK, thank you. So uh, next up is Rachel, please. Is it's that um, obviously food has to be served with alcohol. So if we're serving until 10 o'clock, do we need to have food being served at that time? Or does it mean that if they have their meal at 9 o'clock, that's still OK for them to be having another drink at 10? Because that's for most restaurants sort of serve till 9 o'clock. Um, and most people do tend to book a meal no later than sort of half eight within our, our business. So actually the last orders at 10 becomes another complication because um, people are just, they're probably just all booked late so they can be out later. <laughs> so what, what's the answer as far as the drink after you've finished your meal? As well, long as, yeah. I think it's about reasonability. Right. Yeah. Really. Um, okay. You know, if somebody books a meal at half past eight and they obviously I don't you can't serve alcohol after 10 o'clock, um, mm -hmm. but you yeah. still have customers in the venue. So say you serve, I don't know, a meal at half past eight and somebody has a bottle of wine to go with it. Yeah. And they're still drinking that wine at 10 o'clock. Then that's OK. But obviously you won't be able to then serve them more alcohol. I think, again, if they've had a meal at sort of half past eight and they want a pint or something after the meal, again, that's 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 reasonable because, you know, they're not going to be then on let's say on the session because they're going to have to leave the premises on a, yeah, on a anyway. reasonable yeah, yeah, yeah so, so it's I, on a so we're not going to get um anything against us as long as they've sort of a, actually have eaten and yeah. i think not, what i think what you need to sort of be careful of is people coming in at lunchtime eating and then drinking all afternoon because then mm -hmm. we might start start looking at that um breaching yeah. those those regulations so i think again it's about how you might you're being reasonable really um and yeah so i think yeah, I, as think, you say. I think the main, I mean, there seems to be quite a lot. People do follow the uh, council Facebook page quite closely when it comes to numbers and things. Um, my experience is that they seem to be coming to us, though, to ask the questions as to what they can do. And we, so those once if we do go to tier two, I think one thing I'd ask of you guys would be to put the rules out there. So that people understand as much as you possibly can that they are the rules so us enforcing them doesn't become awkward because they will have seen it on social media um and it is quite confusing for everyone um as, you know us included that um it changes all the time so you know obviously we've got the the, the other side of it where people can be outside in a group of six and mixed households but inside they can't and it's just those little bits of things that I think probably just need to be if it does change put out there more frequent frequently as, as, as often as the um, as the case numbers etc go out okay so can I just add so just add to your response there as well regarding that like I said throughout this pandemic since March I've daily looked at all the incidents that get called into the police with regard to breaches of regulations and if a business accidentally steps out of line or makes a mistake or whatever we are forever getting calls there will be public that will ring us about oh, yeah. a case that might be doing this that and the other 
So I just, you know, all we ask is you do as best you can to abide by the regulations as far as possible and as reasonably as possible. Because if it becomes obvious that you're not, then someone will call the police, they will call the oh, council, yeah, yeah. they will trade the standards. And you know, like, we don't want to be coming down enforcing things anywhere. We want to help the whole of the people that are on this call get back into, a, you know, a trade to be able to, you know, do the job, do the businesses that you own or work in and people to have employment. You know, so we really do want to help him. We don't want to be the enforcement or the, the bad people here. So we just ask that everybody tries to abide wherever they possibly can. And if you have problems with customers or you have issues, then obviously, like I said earlier, speak to the, you know, your councils, the, your, your regulatory services to get that advice. I think the awkward thing is obviously the time of year. And, um, you know, we're, we're at the time of year where it's always hard work. So, and being a being a public house that serves food is it's a difficult mixture of of people to sometimes manage so and obviously at christmas having been locked down for so long and people are desperate to but actually they, they it's that it's that thing that actually their mixing as such has got to happen between the 23rd and 27th within their own home homes and i think that's the that's part of the problem that I can see is that they feel I mean I've I've spoken to several of my customers and they've they think that between the 23rd and the 27th that bubble mixing can happen within hospitality and that that is something that's quite isn't very very clear obviously we're aware of it because that's what we do but the general public aren't and I think I think I totally agree with you, and that's why I mentioned it right at the beginning of the, this webinar to reiterate that you know the the tier you're in when it comes to hospitality is the tier you're in, irrespective of if it's the Christmas period or not. And I think that's obviously something that uh, Matthew can take away from this webinar to make sure relevant comms are, are put out to the you know the general public of Rugby. Yeah, really, 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 really. yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. I suppose a, a couple of useful points that could come out from that, and certainly, yeah, as a as a council, we can we can look at making sure that we're putting out the, the messages that that will help you. Um, uh, one, so that you don't actually have to answer questions; you can actually do your jobs in in, in running your venues, but also just to, to back you up, really, to provide the rules. We can certainly do that. And just uh, occurs we, we've got another question in a minute, but but. Um, Henry, that, that point about whether or not it's OK to sort of have a glass of, of wine and, and after your meal is finished, would you be really looking at you know, what is the purpose of a visit? Has this group come into the pub to have a lot to drink and the meal is the excuse to have it? Or has this group come in for a meal and they're having a drink? It, is, is that a useful way of looking at that question? <laughs> I think that's a really useful way of looking at it, Matthew, and it just is that, that reason, reasonability, isn't it? Um, unfortunately, uh, pubs aren't going to look the same for a while, uh, and it is, it is about going out for a meal and not going out on, on, the, on the session, I suppose, um, unfortunately. But that's how, how the rules are. Um, so that's a really good way of looking at it, Matthew. OK, thanks. So the, the next question is from Alex, please. Alex, uh, are you there? Hello. Yeah, can you hear me? You're, you're very, very faint. Oh, I might, I'll try that instead. Is that better? That, OK, yeah, let's, let's go ahead, please. Great, OK. Um, very quick question. We, we're um, Thanks for doing this, guys. Really appreciate this. Um, we're a very small village club um, and uh, mainly wet led, but we do work through a third party caterer every now and again. And we could possibly do something, but it's going to be on a very kind of a, occasional once a week, twice a week type basis. Is there any flexibility in the support grant to allow partial reopening or is it all or nothing? No, no, that's that's a very good question. Uh, Henry, do you know the answer to that? Or, or I don't Abby, know the answer, I'm afraid. Sorry, uh, Alex. <laughs> Abby, if you know, do come in now. Otherwise, I think it's one for us to take a note of and, and, and get back to you, um, cool. Alex. I'm sorry about that. No worries. Um, oh, Abby, what are you going to say? Yeah. <laughs> I have, pop have I popped up? Yeah. 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 Hi. Um, yeah, not sure on that really, but what I can do is uh, pop a note on the chat. So I'll direct people to the website and I'll put an email address on there so you can direct any 
specific messages to do with grants on there, if that's OK. That's great. Thanks a lot. Thank you. OK, there are no other hands raised have a moment. Um, we'll just pause for a 30 second in case there's any any other last burning questions. But just in, in general terms to wrap up, um, I hope that that was a, a useful session for you as, as traders. Um, welcome your feedback if you want to drop us a line and, and let us know whether this is something that you'd like to see um, as we continue through the, the, the pandemic and hopefully more reopening. Um, Henry, was, was there something you wanted to, to, to say before we wrap up? I think it's just a final point from me, really. Thank you, Matthew. Um, just really, it's all, I guess it's just about planning and, and, and planning for, for what's going to happen. Um, you know, if we do reopen on the 19th, you could find yourself really, really busy. I think you just need to prepare for that scenario, uh, prepare on how are you going to manage numbers, how are you going to not, how are you going to sort of stop people coming in. It might be that you put on, um, you know, have two hour slots for people to come and have a meal. And then you've got a, a, a time period where they can have a meal and a sensible amount of drinks um, and then they can be moved out. And if you give all of that information up front ahead of it, ahead of the reopening, then at least they'll know. And I, th I really do think it's about, you know, you, all of our businesses are really good in rugby and they've really done a, a really good job over over the, the whole of the, the pandemic situation, whether it is, you know, having to stay closed or, or opening with the COVID security. So I'd just like to to say thank you and, and to carry on doing that. And then when we go into tier two, I'm sure you'll all manage it brilliantly. OK, final word, Paul. Yeah, thank you. Uh, to, I just want to reiterate what Henry said. Um, to be honest, over the last few months, we've probably had the least amount of complaints about businesses in rugby compared to anywhere else in Warwickshire. So, you know, that's the tantamount to the, um, you know, the good work that all the businesses have done in working with the local authorities and working with each other and things like that. So, you know, from my perspective, a thank you for that. Um, it is a difficult time. We are all here to try and work through this together as best we can. Uh, please do take the options of, you know, asking for advice off people if you're not sure. Uh, and we all hope that, you know, businesses will be able to reopen on the 19th. Um, we don't know yet, but we all hope you can. And we hope that, you know, you have some sort of a successful Christmas period. So, you know, just from me, thank you for dialing into this because it's it's good for everybody to, you know, be able to listen, ask the questions, and it's probably one of the best attended webinars that I've done um, since I've been doing them. So thank you. Yeah, so uh, it just remains for my dog to interrupt just as I finally come in here. But thank you to our panelists. Thank you for joining us. And yeah, honestly, fingers crossed that we get we get a good announcement next week. Thank you very much for joining us. And you know, your feedback would be very welcome. If you want to have a look in the chat, you'll see that Abby's put a couple of bits of information in there. Otherwise, I think it's probably best if we include that in an email to everyone who participated, just so that you've got that information. Thank you for joining us. Really appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you, Matthew, Henry. Thank you, everybody. Thank you, Thank you all. Bye-bye.